Welcome to Las Vegas Tonight with your award-winning host, Dale Davidson. Dale interviews fascinating guests from top-ranked celebrities to people just like you who have an important story to tell. For more than 15 years, Dale is broadcast every week from the fabulous Las Vegas Strip. He finds the people who really make Las Vegas a one-of-a-kind city and lets the world know just what's happening in this remarkable town. You'll discover why 50 million people visit the entertainment capital of the world every year. Stay tuned for another exciting episode of Las Vegas Tonight. Welcome to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. Thank you so much for tuning in, and boy, are you going to be glad you did it. We have a legend with us. He's a legend in many ways, and he's certainly known throughout Las Vegas. And in fact, two days from now is John Stewart Day. May 5th. That's, That's the it. day that Legends Johnny? in Concert opened. Is that right? Yeah, God May 5th, 1983. Wow, and you are indeed a legend. So... <laughs> Uh, tell me why you decided to become the king of impersonations. Well, because okay. you certainly are. Well, I appreciate that. Is is what happened actually? Uh, I had come to Vegas in 1981 to prepare for a big show back in Knott'sville, Tennessee. Oh, it was okay. the World's Fair. Oh, okay. And I prepared this big fair, and I did it with robots. I had robots and all this kind of exciting stuff <laughs> in Knott'sville. Uh, well, it ended up in Knott'sville, Tennessee, that the whole World's Fair was kind of taken over by a bunch of underground people, not good. Oh, and really? they came to your booth before you opened and said, we're going to collect 50% of all your proceeds. And if you don't give that to us, you'll be a very sorry person. So I said, well, I'm wow. not going to be a sorry person. So I I'm packed dumb. all my stuff back up in the trucks, including the robots, and went back home. You know, yeah. But I did get to go see uh, Pigeon Forge at that time. Oh, yeah, Dollywood. It's, uh, it's only about 40 minutes yeah. away from there. And uh, so uh, Pigeon Forge, I liked it. So I did eventually come back to Pigeon Forge uh, within six months, actually, and opened a big ice show there called Legends on Ice. Oh, And uh, okay. had people, ice skaters, pull the legends around. Dolly Parton, Kenny Rogers, whoever it was. It was a big <laughs> deal. Stayed there for about five years. That's a then great Then they tore idea. the ice rink down and turned it into a, a big mall, a big shopping mall. Oh, and so, okay. uh, But I have a theater in Pigeon Forge now. Wow. We, we're opening up right now the uh, Ricky Nelson's Twin Sons. They have a show. Oh, yeah, and the Nelsons. That's yeah, right, the I Nelsons, remember that. right. Yeah. And they're going to open up in, in, in about a month and uh, at a theater that I'm involved with there with a couple of other people. Okay. And we've been there about three years. Yeah. Of course, right through the COVID and all that kind of dangerous oh, yeah, stuff, it's been yeah. tough. But anyway, so I like Pigeon Forge, and uh, I didn't do the World's Fair. <laughs> but quite a few people from the World's Fair all went to jail. Oh, is so that they right? sent a, a long time. I didn't know that story. That's, yeah, that's, that's, really that's a true story. There's wow. about 18 or 19 major people yeah. that were involved in that that oh, went my in. Lord. But anyway, uh, the Legends uh, thing came about because I had created all this electronic stuff and all this wild stuff that nobody had seen before yeah. to put into a show. Yes. And I thought, where are they going to go see this kind of stuff? They'd have to go to heaven. Yeah. Right? So I knew there was a show called Rock and Roll Heaven. Yes. And I thought, well, I'm going to create a show called Legends in Concert. But to see Legends in Concert, I actually was the voice of our Heavenly Father in the beginning of the show. That's a big... And, I, that's I, right. I had that role and, myself. Oh, you did? Ago. Yes, well, I, I played I thought there was God, only yeah. one of us. <laughs> well, now there's two of us. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, in, in, in the voice, it, the whole thing was the audience went on a trip to heaven to oh, see the okay. superstars of yesterday okay. with the high technology of today. So wow. in the beginning, all the legends were deceased. I didn't yeah. use living legends because right. I thought I might get in trouble copying yes. somebody else, yeah. right? Yeah, who's so, still uh, around. So yeah. I went ahead and I did the voice of legends. And uh, I want you to know that I had my mother there, my grandmother, everybody was at the opening, my sweet wife that's here. And we were all there. And I have always prided myself on never doing shows that were not uh, Christian type shows. That's great. You know, I have been very Suitable heavily involved with my Heavenly Father yeah. from birth. I have nine brothers and sisters. 
years. My parents were heavenly Christ were very good Christians. Wow, that's and great. And everything's great. So anyway, I had everybody there I loved, and the opening dance was a thing I had of Adam and Eve. It was a whole different thing, right? <laughs> and we're all going to heaven. So here comes Adam and Eve out, and I'm sitting back there, and I've just finished the voice of God asking everyone to sit back and relax, and we're going to show you the greatest show in heaven, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. Okay? And the girl comes out, and she comes out swinging, and her top falls off. <laughs> Within 10 seconds, her top falls off, and I'm sitting there, and I, I can't believe it. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I just assumed heaven was maybe better than I thought. No. <laughs> no. But it really did happen. And oh, so, that's hilarious. So we, had, we had to take that dance out of the show. But it, it did happen. And uh, so I want to just tell you that the first Legends shows, because right. you asked me how I became father of the impersonation world. Yes. And this yes. leads into that. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so my first show in Las Vegas, the first number in the show, of course, a girl goes topless. <laughs> you know what I mean? And she immediately That's should, a tradition here. Oh, yeah. yeah she made a, <laughs> should have left the stage, right? And instead, she made the dance uh, approximately an hour and a half longer. No, no, that's not true. Uh, sometimes I stretch it a little bit. Just a little. Uh, just a little. Anyway, so the fact is oh, that I only did deceased people, and I started also uh, making sure the show got big. I mean, we hit it kind of hard. They said this guy went, in the, the review journal at that time said, he went and dug up the graves and is bringing everyone back to <laughs> perform for us. They were all deceased people. Yes. So the fact is that uh, in the process of doing this, the, a lot of the hotels, because the show got real popular real quick, and John Esquaga's Nugget in Reno, right, they yeah, said, yeah. we want you to, can you do Neil Diamond and Barbara Streisand? You know, so right Up away, here, yeah. I had to figure a way to kill them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do that, right? So this is a church show. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, so, that's anyway, So what I did, I started the next show called Legends Live. Those were people that were alive. Oh, okay. And then I had the legends that were deceased. Well, the legends that were alive and some of the state owners of the legends that were deceased all started suing me, yeah. you know, because I hear I got this big show and they I'm doing more money. numbers than they yeah. did when they came to town. Yeah. So the fact is, is what we did uh, on that thing, I, we, I did get sued in the Elvis estate and I tried to become friends with everybody. And so we went to Carson City and we had a major lawsuit right. and here. And I won the lawsuit because in, La in uh, New York, uh, the rights of publicity is as long as you tell somebody that you are not the real person in the promotion and marketing and that you're doing it, right. then it's okay. And it's you have the legal. right to impersonate because yeah. yeah. everything almost is and an impersonation of somebody. And they're public figures. Right. And they're, so, uh, you're protected, yeah, I would think. Yeah, I spent yeah. a couple of hundred thousand dollars trying to re resolve that and I won the case. Right. So when I won the case, uh, I ended up having 25 shows around the world. Wow. You know what I mean? And in the wow. process of that, the uh, Oscar Goodman and those that were here uh, that gave me a star in the Walk of Fame. Oh, that's... And in that star, You were the they first called, producer to get one. Yeah, yes, right? and yeah, they called yeah. it Father of the Impersonation World. So <laughs> I've had that ever since. What an honor. So, what an honor. Uh, the, that's how that happened, and it's gone on forever. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions about uh, your early life. What possessed a young man uh, with a large, as part of a large family, to decide to go into show business? Well, actually, my folks were in show business, kind of like oh, really? the Oswinds, right? Oh, okay. I had nine brothers and sisters. Yeah. My parents sang. They did duets everywhere. We were in uh, Pocatello, Idaho to begin with. Then we went to Sacramento, California. Oh, okay. And they sang. And we had our own TV show called The Singing Stewards. Oh, is that and right? And we had the TV show there. And on that TV show, I was Banjo Johnny. <laughs> and uh, during that process of being Banjo Johnny, I won uh, a big award on the Author Godfrey Show as Banjo Johnny. I was only wow. like seven years old, seven wow. or eight years old. That's of course, huge. it was in, in our blood by then, right? Oh, yeah. I sang with my brothers and sisters, duets and, and trios. Burl Lives, I heard. Burl, right? Burl Lives. Yeah. Burl Lives. I did that in Sacramento, too, at the Sacramento State Fair. Uh, I actually was kind of on the lap of Burl Ives doing, I know an old lady who swallowed a fly, but why, oh, why'd she swallow the fly? Perhaps she'll die. You know, that was his song. <laughs> so anyway, I did that with the banjo and did sing some songs with Burl oh, Ives. that's cute. And so I've been... So it was in your blood, right? From yeah, Bell. I went from there to the Vienna Boys Choir, and from there wow. I went down and got a job on the Bob Hope Show. 
Oh, is yeah, that right? So we moved to California because of that. Oh, and okay. And when we moved to California, I started doing the Bob Hope Show and the Cliffy Stone Show, Ted Mack Amateur Hour shows. I was doing shows a long time. Oh, And okay. in uh, uh, Audubon Junior High School, that's when I first met Mike Love and Brian Wilson and all those guys. I lived in the, oh, in the same Beach area Boys. where they all lived. Oh, okay. And they all went to church with me. Is that right? Yeah, they did. They oh. were about five years older than me. And my brother also, he's about three years older than me. He was the first singer with the uh, Pendletons at that time. They weren't quite the Beach Boys yet. Oh. And then he went on to college because they hadn't made it that big yet. Yeah. And I went on to... Uh, uh, I got lots of offers to go out and do jobs uh, in uh, like Broadway shows and stuff like that. That's because I was a singing tenor. And uh, so the fact is that uh, I joined them, started singing with them, and then I was on the road so long that they finally became really big, right? Really big. The Huge. Beach Boys Huge. instead of the Pendletons. Huge. And uh, I wasn't there. I, w I was out doing my shows thinking, <laughs> oh, I'm going to be a lot bigger than these guys. <laughs> You know, this is going to be nothing. Well, that was what they call a mistake. <laughs> no. But actually, uh, as it is now, You're still the way things have turned out, I, I turned out okay. Yes. And they're having a little bit more trouble than I'm at. <laughs> it's just, anyway, but I love them. Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful story. Um, now, tell me about Steve Martin. You're Steve Martin went to, June, to uh, high school with me, Garden Grove High School. Okay. And uh, I was the uh, president of the drama club there. Wow. You know, the senior class play was being presented. So I got Steve Martin, and I, uh, uh, he was a friend of mine. He wanted to be in the play. So he ended up, uh, uh, we, I gave him a part in the play. You yes. know, and uh, we did that, and he wasn't a performer at the time. Oh, he hadn't sorry. been doing anything. Okay. You know, so in the process of doing that, he got to be in the play. I got to know him pretty good. Then uh, I ended up being an entertainment director out at Knott's Berry Farm, which is oh, in Orange County. Yeah, you know? sure. And the process Huge. of that was that the Birdcage Theater, I started writing and directing and putting all those shows together. Wow. So Steve you Martin were, wanted to get You were still involved. a kid, yeah. I was, well, I was a senior in oh, high school. okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so the fact is that Steve wanted to be out there, too. Yeah. So we hired Steve. And I introduced Steve to Don Galvin. He's the world's class banjo player. Oh, okay. And Steve got hung up with Don Galvin and started playing the banjo. And yeah, he's good <laughs> fact, at it. He my is. wife and I, when we went through the dressing room, she had to go through his dressing room every day to get to the stage. Yes. He was practicing the banjo every day for <laughs> five years that he was there. It's amazing. But the fact is that uh, Steve played the comic and the hero, and we also did an oleo together. Oh, yeah. I played the guitar and he played the banjo and we sang and did this and that and whatever, <laughs> you know. So we became good friends. That's And great. Uh, then uh, when I came here to Vegas and became a show producer doing shows, right. I might as well tell this part of it because it leads into it. Sure. Are you sure you don't want to talk more? <laughs> 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 but anyway, I don't want to interrupt. The stories are too great. <laughs> so anyway, Steve Martin uh, called me up while I'm doing good here. I thought everything was great. He said, would you come down for a couple of days to Universal? And I have a uh, show I'm doing called The Man with Two Brains. And wow. I'd like you to be in it. Wow. I said, oh, that, that's great. This is a big it's, movie. It's, yeah, my wife tells me I don't even have one brain. So I thought maybe... <laughs> It would be something I had. So anyway, I went down to uh, Universal Studios, went, went on the lot, and out on the lot, these big trailers. I mean, they're beautiful. One of them said John Stewart. The other one said Steve Martin. I thought, oh, my gosh, what am I, what am I doing here? He didn't send me a script or anything. Now, in the, the show he did with me, he only had a couple of lines yes, you know, in yes. high school. Yeah. So all at once, uh, they, he, I said, well, where do I get on the set and what, what do I do? What do I, when I, get I, I don't have a script, I don't have anything. He said, well, we'll, we'll tell you, you'll be all right. So <laughs> I go over and they go to the costume place and they dress me up like a doorman. Oh, and I okay. A doorman. I thought, okay. So I'm, I'm standing there at the doorman and on the street and he comes down in the car like this. Uh, he's trying to find a lady to get her brain out of her head, I guess. And he hits <laughs> this lady in the road and, and I run out there and my line was, Get away. You shouldn't be here. Get away. Get away. That was his lines in high school. That's all I got. <laughs> that was it. 
<laughs> they said, you're done. Uh, what? Yeah, take your trailer and leave. Yeah. <laughs> Never got a chance to enjoy the trailer. That, that was it. That was it. So anyway, but that's he, a great, uh, great story. He's still yeah. very close to me. I love the guy. Oh, that's yeah, We were in high school, and yeah. everything's great. Wow, we got some great stories to come yet with Johnny Stewart. What a great guest! You're going to want to stick around because there's even more. Yeah, we'll be back right after this. Hi, I'm Dale Davidson, host of Las Vegas Tonight. You know, radio has an enduring place in the heart of America. Sometimes it's music that can enliven your spirit or keep you company when you need some. More often for me, it's just been the right spoken word or two that can quiet my mind and soul. Radio brings me a reassuring word in the quiet of night or a welcoming voice early in the morning as I shake off the night's sleep and find my way into God's purpose for my day. And always, I find the best radio station is the one that brings me the best news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. My favorite radio station is KKVV in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's still right where it's been for years at 1060 on the AM dial, hovering over Sin City like a gospel airship broadcasting the good news of the abounding love that Jesus Christ has for every single one of us. No matter who you are or where you live, you can receive God's word via the KKVV Gospel Airship. Just go to kkvv.com and click on Listen Live. KKVV is using all the tools that God's provided them, like podcasting and video streaming and video on demand to produce programs that lift up our fellow believers and save the lost. If you feel a calling to speak to others about Jesus Christ on your very own show, pick up the phone and call the station. They'll be happy to tell you how. Call KKVV today at 702-731-5588 or drop them an email at kkvvradio at hotmail.com. Please join me in becoming part of the KKVV family. You'll be glad you did. And welcome back to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. We have been regaled by Johnny Stewart, and he's got more regalement in mind for us. Some <laughs> terrific stories. Uh, we so appreciate having him on the show. Thanks again for coming. Well, thank on. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I want to talk to you about your lovely bride. You said you've been married for fifty-eight years to Alex. To Alex. And there she is. Yeah, Hi, Donna Alex. Alexandria Alt. Now oh. it's Stuart. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so, tell us how how you met and, well, and all of that. Uh, actually, I went from Knott's Berry Farm, right. uh, where I was doing lots of entertaining and all that, out to a church dance in Long Beach. Okay. And in that church dance, I go in there. And I was an entertainer for it. So I sang for about 20 minutes and did a show. Right. Did that for lots of church dances, right? right? And uh, so then uh, I went to leave, and my buddy that went out there with me says, oh, you gotta go in and see this girl. She's unbelievable. You gotta go see her. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, I was just 18 at the time, right? Yeah. So I already had 12 children. No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. no children yet. Okay. <laughs> anyway, That's hilarious. So I was 18. I go in there, and this girl that he pointed out, she was already dancing with some guy. But at the church dance, Dale, you can yeah. you can tap them on the shoulder, and they got to give up. Yes. You know what I mean? That's so, good. Uh, they gave up, and uh, <laughs> then I danced with him. And, uh, no, no, I, no, it was her. It was her I danced with. I, I, I knew it was. I, I knew I was making a mistake here. <laughs> anyway, so you danced with somebody. You're I pretty danced sure with, of that. So anyway, I danced with her, and she was everything this guy told me. And I danced with her. And Dale, this is the truth. In an actual formal dance, just dancing with somebody. Yeah. Uh, uh, other than my mother, I think once I've never danced with another girl. We went together from that dance on yeah. and got married at, about a year later, wow. got married at 19, wow. and uh, we've been married ever since. Congratulations. Uh, we have uh, 11 children, wow. two of our own, and then we've uh, assisted uh, through adoption and other things, raising other children. Okay. So we really 
uh, credit ourselves with 11 children right. and we're still gratefully, legally, blissfully married. Oh, okay, so great. Uh, what a wonderful story. Yeah, I am afraid of her. <laughs> Otherwise, I would, have, I would have left her a long time ago. But she is dangerous. <laughs> but anyway, she's, uh, she's actually here in the audience, so I have to be careful what I yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, be very careful at all times. Yeah. Great lady. That keeps you, keeps you married. Keeps it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Kenny Rogers. Tell me about Kenny oh, Rogers. Oh, this is a riot. Okay. So uh, the show Legends became so good that when... Uh, now, if Kenny Rogers came into town to perform over at Caesars, which yeah. he did at times, or the Mirage or wherever, whoever came into town, I didn't put them on the stage. I didn't put my people on the stage impersonating them. I felt it was a courtesy to take my people out. Yeah. So when people... Rod Stewart... we have tremendous Rod Stewart's. Any of them came into town. Oh, that's another story. Yeah. That's one of my best stories. I oh, got to tell you that one. Okay. I haven't told many people Please that do. one. Yeah. So it, it, Dale, so the fact is that uh, I took my people out, but I got a call one day from Ken Cragen, the manager of Ken, Kenny Rogers. Yeah, okay? okay. Now, keep in mind, I knew Kenny Rogers a little bit because I did do Pigeon Forge oh, uh, when I did okay. the World's Fair back in 1982. So he was okay? playing there. Yeah, and he was around and yeah. all that, and yeah. Dolly Parton, and I used their characters actually in my show. Oh, okay. Uh, there, yeah. okay? But the fact is, uh, Kenny Rogers' manager said, hey, Kenny Rogers would like to come into town and do your show. He wants to be in your show as an impersonator. <laughs> and uh, Jay Leno. That's a great we, idea. We always close every year for the Jay Leno show. When it came to Las Vegas, we were the closing act. Mm. He loved legends. Okay. So the fact is uh, that uh, uh, Kenny Rogers wanted to do that. And I couldn't imagine they wanted to, but they did. So yeah. uh, I said, okay. And we set it up through the hotel and all that. Gave him a big suite, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, right. And the thing that was unique about it was the fact they wanted to rehearse all day long with my Dolly Parton to uh, be able to uh, do Islands in the Stream oh, and all these yeah, songs. Yeah. We were going to go on that night. Yeah. I mean, it's a big deal. So we That's did it. That's a great idea. And, and she came to me and she said, you know, I still like uh, uh, our Kenny Rogers better than this guy. Where did you get this guy? <laughs> And I said, well, this guy won a show in Chicago, and so he gets one night here, and none of my cast, they didn't want any of my cast or anybody to know, and Jay Leno swore to him, you'll never come off as the number one impersonator. You won't be number one. So the fact is that uh, uh, we finally went to do the show, and about 20 minutes before he was to go on, he said, I want to go backstage and uh, uh, come out of my dressing room cross the stage, say hi to the cast, and let them know I'm the real guy. Yeah. I said, I've been lying to him for two weeks. Now I want you're the real guy, and I told him you won a contest in Chicago. <laughs> I said, they, they know I joke around a lot, but there's no way they're going to believe that you're the real guy, <laughs> that you came here on our show. They're not going to believe it. He said, well, I think they will. Let's go do it. And Ken Cragen said, you probably ought to listen to John. He, you know, I, he said, no, I'm going to do it. He goes in the dressing room, and he goes in, and he says, John, let me do the introduction. I said, okay. So he says, I just want you all to know I am the real Kenny Rogers. And it was, you could have heard a pin drop, Dale. It and was unbelievable. Going, Next thing you hear, my Neil Diamond goes, I'm so glad at least somebody came out and is honest. We are all the real people, too. <laughs> I am the real Neil Diamond. I am the real Neil Diamond. And then they brought the girls in from the dressing room. I'm the real Marilyn Monroe. Oh, my gosh. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. So he says, I'm out of here. Didn't want to do the show. Wanted to go back upstairs and not, really? not do the show. Yeah. So Ken Craig had finally talked him into doing the show. He did the show, okay? And if the cast was so mad at me, thinking this guy was the real guy and he was there. But I did tell the truth. I told him what I was, you know. The fact is, he did the show. And I told him not to talk during the show. I said, you got to move. I don't allow my people to talk. Yeah. He says, well, you know, I am Kenny Rogers. I said, you're the only one that knows that. Nobody else knows it. So anyway, he talked and I said, if you talk during the show, I did, a lot of people are going to go to the bathroom. And I, we have about an average at the Imperial Palace, right. about uh, 18, excuse me, 800 people wow. would go average per show. <laughs> yes. Nowadays, you're lucky to get eight, but it was 800. Okay. So anyway, 
Uh, he uh. starts talking. 19 people went to the bathroom. <laughs> Nobody went to the bathroom during any other part of the show. But they, he talked. Okay. And by the way, he is a great guy, and I loved him, and it was great oh, that he was there. But start. you're taking a real person and making him an impersonator, and they don't. There's no relationship. That's just. Because, uh, if it was Jay Leno, really, right? Yeah, if a person really starts thinking they're the real person, it kind of goes against you, <laughs> you know, because you're a wacko. So you know? Jay Leno was right. He, yeah. he would not have won the number well, one. Well, the Entertainment Tonight filmed it. So the <laughs> fact is, we had seven cameras there filming this thing. Oh, wow. So after the show, we go out in the audience and then go to the lobby. So there was one person there that went to buy a picture because you could buy all the pictures of the legends. Right. And she said, well, here's a picture of the Kenny Rogers because we had Kenny Rogers in our show. We took him out yeah. to do him. Yeah. And she said, well, this guy looks more like Kenny Rogers than the guy in the show. <laughs> I thought, oh, this, this is not going to be good. So we had about uh, 17 people interviewed. No uh, one thought he was the best legend. <laughs> he is great, but no one thought he was at that time compared to all these different that's, people. That's hilarious. And then the cast found out he was the real guy, and they almost strung me up. I mean, it was the real dude, you know, out there. So The boss anyway, lied to us. He was a great guy. And he, uh, then he had me do the same thing to Dolly Parton in Pigeon Forge because oh, I had a show right? in Pigeon wow, Forge too. Oh wow. Uh, I had about 25 shows all around the world and in Pigeon Forge Dolly Parton wanted to do what Kenny did uh, only in her own theater. Yeah. Didn't want to do it in our theater so is what we did we took our Dolly Parton she had opening Dolly Parton day and uh, held about 2400 people in her theater yes. and then uh, when she did that I had my Dolly Parton come out and sing three songs. Nobody complained. They all thought that was Dolly Parton. Yes, that was it. They were happy. She was it. And uh, then on the fourth song, uh, the Dolly Parton sang, Anything you can do, I can do better. And then Dolly Parton walked on and said, No, you can't. <laughs> yes, I can. No, you can't. And then two Dolly Partons out there. That's oh, my hilarious. goodness. Then the audience finally realized what was going on <laughs> so dolly did this to herself but she did it to protect herself a little bit uh, she just protected herself better that's but great, uh, she was a great story. lady also that's you know? a great story and so that that happened so tell me uh, about rod stewart tell me the rod stewart this is a real good one i get a call from the entertainment director of caesars right. uh and uh, they called me up and they said uh, uh there's a guy over here that looks like rod stewart a little bit do you want to uh, come over? He wants you to come over and he would sing for you. I said, well, where's he at? He said, he's at the pool. I said, oh, no, no, no. He'd have to come to the show and I audition uh, after the show. He'd come over here and audition and I'll do that. Yeah. He said, well, this would be a favor to me, John. You know, you got to be kiss up to all the entertainment directors. Right? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he said, this would be a favor to me. Come on over and do this for me. I appreciate it. I said, I can't believe it. I said, okay, listen, I'll come over. I'll come over as a favor to you and we'll do it. So I go over there and we go out by the pool and he's under this big cabana, whatever it is, and all kinds of people around him, kind of like he looked like he was kind of popular. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I go over there, but keep in mind, he had been in the pool. So yeah. his hair wasn't exactly like it looked yeah, like Rod Stewart. No, kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. He uh, is over there sitting there and, and the, I interview him a little bit and said, uh, how long have you been doing Rod Stewart? He said, well, quite a while. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, listen, uh, do you want to uh, come over and sing? Do you, what do you want to do? He said, well, could I sing right out here by the pool? I says, you can, but you'd have a better shot if we <laughs> use our orchestra and we'll do it and we'll, we'll entertain. Then everyone started laughing around me, quite a yeah, bit of laughing. Yeah. I thought, what's going on here? You know what I mean? And all at once, uh, after talking to him and making a fool of myself for 10 minutes, all at once, uh, uh, the girl says, hey, he is Rod Stewart. <laughs> and it was the real Rod Stewart. Wow. And he was out there. And uh, so I, I told him he should really lose his ability to entertain because his hair didn't look the same anymore. <laughs> so, honey. <laughs> so we had a good time. And, and so I've had a few of those kind of things with uh, That's great. different people That's you know, great. doing it. Yeah. Uh, there's a former entertainer who's now a pastor, Bill Walker, here in town. Who, who was a dead ringer for him. And he used to be in, in a He's a dead act. ringer for Rod Stewart? Yeah, and, he, and he, he, they had an act called The Walkers, and they were a lounge act here in Las Vegas years ago. But he's a pastor now. But he said that, that he, you know, he wears his hair the same way and everything. 
And he said, whenever Rod Stewart's in town, he gets stopped multiple yeah, times. Yeah, I can mess my hair up and kind of look <laughs> like him, too. Now. <laughs> Tell me about uh, where the shows are right now and, and how many it shows at the peak around the world. Well, about uh, 17 years ago, uh, involved in, in some things that were going on, and I went public and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, I ended up selling Legends and Concert, right. uh, but stayed in the entertainment business because right. the Legends and Concert show was taking me all over the world, and I was gone. I had quite a few kids, yes. and I was gone sometimes two or three months at a time. Yes. So it became quite difficult. So I felt comfortable. I sold Legends, but I kept doing other shows. You know, like yeah. right now in town, I have a show called uh, The Piano Man, which oh, is a tribute okay. to Elton John and Billy Joel oh, at okay. the Mosaic Theater on the Strip. It's oh, yeah. uh, right across from the park, sure. MGM Grand. Yeah. And then uh, I'm involved as a consultant in a lot of shows. Today I have a show planned tonight, actually, at the David Sachs V Theaters, oh, yeah, okay, which sure. is at Planet Hollywood, yes. back in the Miracle Mile Mall. I know where they and are. And yeah. that's a group of people that have been doing it for about 30 years, gold records, uh, platinum albums, everything, and it's a family called the Jets. Uh, the worf real name is Wolfgrams, but they went by the Jets. Okay. And uh, so we have that show, and uh, it, that's an awesome show, and they sing and do that, and I'm the uh, manager and, and put that show in there yes. you know, as a thing. In, in doing shows right now, I told you about the one we have with the uh, Ricky Nelson's twins yes. uh, in Pigeon Forge. Yeah, so they have talent. Uh, I like yeah, them. Yeah. yeah, I'm still doing shows and consultant for shows and all that kind of thing. That's fantastic. Yeah, my wife said if you ever get out of show business, I'm leaving you. So I, <laughs> I just stayed in it. I think she's going to stick around. Fifty-eight <laughs> years, I think she's going to stick around. Speaking of which, we're going to need to take a brief break, and we're going to come back with a surprise guest. We'll be back right after this. I said, I think they want to see it. I think the music never dies, and they're going to want to see that. So I created Legends in Concert. With I had a guy that was a drummer of mine, and that drummer happened to be the father of a young boy that was only five years old. He ended up growing up as Bruno Mars. They graduated at Garden Grove High School with me as Steve Martin, and we hired him out there, and he also coordinated things, playing the hero and the comic and all that stuff. And then we, when I was about 15, I had an opportunity to this thing with the people that made the Beach Boys, the Beach Boys, the famous Beach Boys. One dance only, I ended up getting engaged shortly thereafter to a lovely girl named Alex Alt, which is now, of course, Alex Stewart. When we first started our show, he helped us craft our show. Yes. And I gotta mention his wife. She helped oh, us yes. too with our, our stage uh, costumes, so it's been great. Johnny's awesome. The Legacy. John Stewart is one of the greatest men I've ever known in my life. He's the best. I love him. Yes, John Stewart, the father of legends, and Mr. Vegas. That's why he is Mr. Vegas. It's obvious the constitution of the title, Mr. Vegas, applies as a perfect crown that sits upon his head. It's elegant, it's meaningful, and it's direct to a man that carries that title. Mr. Vegas, Johnny Stewart. The sign on the main building, which is the barn. Welcome, come on in. <laughs> okay. Welcome JT. to the I think he's a wonderful man. I think he has good heart and good strength, good morals. He's a wonderful gentleman with our family, our children. Here's the John Stewart star in the Walk of Fame, which I would not have if it wasn't for this beautiful lady here. That's my wife of 58 years. She came here to me in Vegas with me on May 5th, 1983. And you helped create that star in the Walk of Fame, okay? And welcome back to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. Before we went to break, I said there was going to be a surprise guest, and there is a drop-in of a star, <laughs> the lovely Alex, oh, who is dear. Mrs. John Stewart. Well, Thanks for right. coming on, Alex. 
Oh my goodness, I don't know how to handle this whole thing. <laughs> you look very nice. I'm you're very happy. sparkly. Am I sparkly? Yeah, you're sparkling. That's very pretty. Oh, very thank pretty. You. I have so, a few more sparkles at home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she, she's an angel, always up in the air and harping about something. <laughs> but a big. So, uh, that's one of his favorite jokes. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> Speaking of which, what's it like living with uh, with an entertainer twenty four seven? Very difficult. <laughs> but somehow you've made it work for and, a long oh, he, time. He makes it work because he just thinks he's the funniest ever. So <laughs> I, I, I'm just trained to laugh. There you go. We all need a laugher <laughs> yeah. in our lives. So what was uh, what was attractive about this guy when when you first met him? He was very, very open with me and fun. Oh, okay. And he he invited me out on dates. Oh, that's nice. What kind of places did he take you in the early days? Oh, wherever they do the... Uh... No, remember I took her to the uh, theater where I did this, the show, the right. Birdcage Theater. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I did an oleo, and I said, I'm dedicating this song to this new girl I just took I'd out. I have to be on the oleo. <laughs> okay. And remember that song? She's hated that song ever since. It was called, When I'm Not Near the Girl I Love, I Love the Girl I'm Near. From <laughs> Frinian's Rainbow. That's what he did. That's right. He says... We were having a kind of a little date, and he says to me, "I've got, I, I, he's, I've got this uh, song. I'm going to sing to you <laughs> during the oleo." He's, yeah, he's the song, and he got me up on the on the thing for the saying when I'm not near the girl I love. Oh, I you love came up on I'm stage. Near. He invited me up on. That was sang, his big deal. Sang directly to you. Yeah, that's hilarious. I'm not yeah. with the girl I love. I love the girl I'm near. I was so. heartbroken. <laughs> Dale, to, to get I even with me, broken. she wanted me to go over and see the alligators oh, at Knott's Berry Farm. I oh. did. This oh, is okay. the truth. So I go over to the alligators, and, him. <laughs> and we go up to this little alligator that seems to be sleeping. Yeah, I see. And, and uh, she says, flick it. I was like, okay, we wanted to wake it up. I flicked it, and I almost had lost this whole finger. It <laughs> bit my finger completely. It's, I still got it scarred. The alligator uh, bit me right through did. my finger. That's a he great way to get it. even with this smart aleck guy. <laughs> that was your fault. Oh, that was my fault. <laughs> yeah, kind of, maybe. <laughs> tell me tell me about raising all those kids. Well, what was that like? It was a wonderful thing. But uh, we had uh, so many people within our church whose families, they didn't have they didn't have room for their families. Oh, really? And so, just one by one, I started taking them. Taking them in. Uh -huh. A lot of families who decide they think want children, then they change their minds. Then uh, they, uh, then the children are left homeless. Yes. So uh, here I am. Yes. I gathered them and raised them. Wow. And still, uh, you, still are raising be... them. They still are calling us, wondering, you know, are we going to? come and get them more stuff. <laughs> Dale, I'm not going to take time from her, but this is a good one you to talk to her about. Yeah. So we had, she had a white Rolls Royce, you oh, know, because right? we were doing pretty good in Legends, right? Yes. Yeah. And so the thing, I come home in the uh, uh, one evening, because uh, I come home between shows, and she had a lady there and her son, about a 15-year-old guy, and she had stopped the Rolls Royce in a park on... Uh, uh, in Las Vegas, uh, a, a park that was somehow just off of Flamingo. Okay. Anyway, and they, she went out there, and they were in a cardboard shacks, and they were living in the they shacks. They were living in the shacks. Yes. Yeah. And she stopped her car, went out into the shacks by herself, and invited them to come home for dinner. Okay? And we had a little guest place there at the house, at the ranch, right? Because yeah. we had Legends Ranch for seven, oh, for 27 years. Yes. And we had horses there and all this. And there was a little place to stay out there. And she gave them that place to stay. Okay? Wow. And they had a bedroom and they could take a bath and all this and <laughs> went out shopping. So tell them about that. Tell them about what happened to those people. You remember? Tell me a little clue. Well, <laughs> the, the thing about it was, uh, we worked with the uh, city, and uh, she got him an apartment to wow, be in. Wow. Uh, she wow. went out and bought him a bicycle, uh, bought him some wow. clothes, yeah. and uh, all that stuff, yeah. and uh, got her a job. Yeah. And uh, so she called us up after about two weeks of this and said, I don't want this kind of a life. I don't like this life. And she ended up having to take the lady back 
out to her cardboard box in the uh, field in, in her Rolls Royce and empty them out again in that situation. Oh do you remember gosh. that? Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I do. Well, what a, what a big heart you right. have, yeah. Alex. Oh. But she did. Took them in a cardboard box. What a yeah. big, big heart you yeah. have. The part that was worse is I had to, you know, we had lots of dogs and they had lots of little messes. Yeah. And all I did in that whole time, we had all that great, big, fantastic, I was, I was the cleaner of all of that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah one, of, one of the nicest ranches. <laughs> and I in, told in her, town, what would happen yeah. if we got divorced? And uh, she gave me a cardboard box. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it was but, I couldn't, but I couldn't find the lady. I didn't have anybody to be with. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's funny. That's too funny. You always were able to find the beautiful women. <laughs> So, so the uh, the kids still come by all of the, all all oh, of your children. Oh yes, that they you call us in? and remind us if we haven't gotten back to them and re given them more more clothing, more <laughs> things like that. More stuff. Johnny, I've been calling. This is the, really the truth. I've been calling and I can't get anyone to answer me, and I need some more things. <laughs> really, I needed wow. more clothing. Wow. Well, and both of you have big So hearts. we had a young girl, the, since this is kind of Alex's part of it, we had a young girl that came to Legends all the time with her mother. Yeah. And this little girl, her name was Crystal. Yeah, Crystal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And she, Crystal adopted her as her mother. Wow. And so Crystal had a baby eventually, but when she was going, first started going to our show, her mother was pregnant with her. Uh, she wasn't even born yet. Wow. Then all at once, Crystal's all at once now 18, 19 years old. <laughs> she has a baby. And so... Crystal couldn't take care of the baby, didn't have the ability to do that, and she went out and found the baby at home and got her legally adopted, and that boy now has graduated from college oh. and uh, has kind of a, we know him very well, and, yeah, and Crystal, he now knows is his mother, but he, we all became friends, but she goes around finding people homes and do whatever she can do. Mm -hmm. She's that oh. kind of a heart and that kind of a woman. Oh, what, a, what, a, what a sweet lady. Oh, that lady. was sweet, Johnny. Yeah, yeah you owe me. <laughs> I do. <laughs> But she, know, she needs her own star okay, yeah. on okay. the walk she of fame, does. too. Well, they yeah. still call me, and they still want their, you know, their surprises to come in to the, the children. Oh, that's they, They're nice. not children anymore. They're adults. That's but. sweet. Yeah. So do you guys really love Las Vegas? You are Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. Vegas. Yeah. But do you still like this town? I love it. Do you? I love this town. Yeah. We, tell, we lived at me. the Imperial Palace six years oh, up in the suites right? with wow. uh, Ralph Engelstad. Yeah. Wow. And that was fun and wonderful. Was it? Mm -hmm. What's it like living in a hotel? Wonderful. Is it? They <laughs> yeah. take care of all your needs. Yes, they do. Yeah. And it's really exciting and fun and you meet a lot of new people and it's really wonderful really. It's a great experience. M must have must have been a big change for you to move in into that ranch. Yeah. All those it, all it those was. acres. Just yeah. just to show her heart, there was one boy, my boy, we had a son, our uh, first son had cerebral has cerebral palsy. Oh, He's okay. John Michael Stewart, and he is one of the most successful social service workers with a master's degree and everything here oh, in town. That's great. Uh, but when he first was going to a school, he went to a Carl Harvey, a school for handicap in okay. Orange County. Oh, okay. And in the process of doing that, uh, Alex met a boy that was... Uh, uh, paralyzed from the waist down, had spina bifida. Oh, I know okay? that. Yeah, that and of course, uh, she wanted to take him in. Uh, so we di didn't take him in right away, but we the very weekend that we met him, we took him to uh, Disneyland. Remember us mm -hmm. taking? Yeah. His name was David. Yes. Okay, and yeah. he was seven at the time. Oh, so we boy. took him to Disneyland, and at the end of Disneyland, we took him back to where he was staying, which was a, a home for uh, handicapped people, and a, a lot of those were also mentally handicapped. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we uh, took him back, and I'm walking back to the car, and Alex points out the window that he came out to the porch because he could only go in a wheelchair. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so she says, what do you think? I said, what are you thinking? She says, let's take him. We we took him. Oh, wow. And he was with us for uh, 38 years. He wow. died just a few years ago here wow. in Vegas. He worked for me. And do uh, uh, you remember that, right? I do. What a blessing. Yeah. I so do. he was with us that. that entire time. Oh, yeah. So we've had that kind of a deal. Oh, yeah. You guys have great, great hearts. 
and uh, Las Vegas is lucky to have you both. Oh, thank you, yeah, thank you. I really, really. Well, you've, it's a really great been gift a to us, really. Oh. The whole experience was a great gift, oh. and uh, grateful for it. That's no, that's so I have nice. a whole bunch more, so I can have a whole, many, a whole bunch more kids. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> no, but um, I really did love them. Speaking of great hearts, and obviously you're you're informed by your faith. Um, John, let me impose upon you, as I mentioned, I would do, this is your camera right here. Would you, would you take a, a few minutes uh, and address the audience directly, uh, talk a little bit about why uh, living with Jesus Christ is a great idea? Jesus Christ and the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost that he gives us, is a unbelievable thing. And you're not gonna get through this life the way you want to get through this life, if you don't give Jesus Christ the benefit for giving you, me, all of us, the power of discernment. The power of discernment to be able to make up your mind what you think is right and what you think is wrong. And you have to do what you think is right under the inspiration of our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is going to guide you. That's why we have the Holy Spirit and we have these intuitions. And he helps us to decide what is good and what is bad. And to be an overcomer, which means you can overcome anything. And if you can't do it with just yourself, then you use the power of our Father in heaven, Jesus Christ. And all the blessings that he's given us. And he's given us a road map through the Bible. And we can read that Bible and hear and know every aspect of what he wants us to do. And us be able to do the things we're supposed to do because our heart wants us to do it. And no matter what it is, he is going to take care of us. He's going to be there for us. So no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what it is, if you will all at once give your heart and your mind and your soul to Jesus Christ and share that with those around you, and use that power of discernment to overcome anything that you need. Test the water, see what it is, and if you don't feel comfortable and you wouldn't wanna do what you're doing in front of your heavenly Father, then don't do it. Don't be the power of discernment to be an overcomer. And that's what I would give you uh, as something that I feel with all my heart, my mind, and my soul, is that you need to be a follower, a believer, a lover, of this world and Jesus Christ and all the things that are going on, remember, no matter what happens to you, however old you get or however when you die, you pass on. But pass it on is just taking a trip to a better and bigger place and put you back in the prime of your life and you're gonna be able to spend eternity with your Heavenly Father because He died for you, He died for me, and He rose again and is gonna make it so that we all have eternal existence. So be an overcomer and use your power of discernment and be a lover of Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you so much, Johnny. That was very touching. That was beautiful. Oh, wasn't it beautiful? Yeah. Um, would you close us in prayer? Um, we have a couple more minutes left and, and uh, I know that you're, you've already touched our audience and, and you'll really take us to a whole different level if you close us out in prayer. Okay. Our dear, kind, gracious Father in heaven, we come before thee here as a group of Christians that believe in thee and all the purposes of thee and thy Son, Jesus Christ and God the Eternal Father. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we reach into our hearts and our minds and we thank thee for every possible blessing we have. And we ask thee to bless all the people related to this Christian show, that this Christian show will go out and reach the hearts and minds of those that watch it and those that look for something that is very special and be able to do it in a way that would be acceptable to our Father in heaven, that we will always think and believe and know that our Father in heaven gave us the greatest example on earth. And we appreciate all of our blessings. We appreciate all the people connected to this show, the technicians and the, all the people in promotion and marketing and directing and producing. We appreciate all these wonderful, wonderful things. And we appreciate 
the fact that Rick and Terry uh, that are associated with this show are going to be able to continue to deliver this wonderful message. And we certainly appreciate the person that is bringing this show to you from a visual standpoint, Dale Davidson, that he is going to be able to continue doing great blessings upon all of you by being able to bring people on this show that will inspire all of us to do the right thing for the right reason. Now we ask for these blessings and we thank thee for everything. We ask thee to bless the world that it will be overcome some of the horrible things it's going through. And we ask that the sickness and uh, people that are in poverty and all these things that our Heavenly Father will help bless those people and bring them back to reality and bring them back to a good life. We love thee. We appreciate thee. We appreciate all that's been done for us and mankind. And we say these things humbly in the name of this Christian broadcast show, in our name of Jesus, the Almighty Christ. Amen. And amen. Wow, that was wonderful. Thank Brought you. me to tears. That was a great, great that prayer. That was beautiful. Thank you. That was beautiful. And now you know why uh, Johnny and Alex Stewart mm -hmm. are legends <laughs> here in Las Vegas. Thank, Thank you, you both for coming on. Oh. Wow, great he's, guest. He's my great, working great man. He is, isn't he? He's yeah. the best. <laughs> yeah. God bless you both. Thank and you. as I try to remember to say each and every episode of Las Vegas Tonight, when it comes to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, please walk with him. God bless you.
What is the Bible? What does it say? Why do people care about it? And what does it have to do with you? Christians claim the Bible was authored by God through human hands to share his story and help us understand who he is. It's a diverse collection of literature, including historical accounts, poetry, stories, and wisdom. It contains mind-blowing adventures like men being thrown into a fire-filled furnace. Yet they weren't burned. It speaks of an old man who was lowered into a lion's den, only to be supernaturally protected and not eaten. It also tells the story of a little girl who had died, yet miraculously came back to life. The Bible is one book that contains 66 smaller books. It was written over a period of 1,500 years and authored by over 40 different people that range from shepherds to doctors, scholars, farmers, and kings. Completed 2,000 years ago, historians say it's one of the most reliable books on the planet. Over 10,000 manuscripts have survived the centuries. Compare that to only 235 known manuscripts of Shakespeare's first folio. Mm -hmm. There have been over 5 billion copies printed worldwide making it the most reproduced book in the world. The Bible is divided into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is well known for its early history of the world and insight into life, giving wisdom such as don't murder and love one another. Other sections are a bit racy, such as your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. The first four books in the New Testament tell the story of Jesus through the perspectives of four of his closest friends. The rest of the New Testament is stories and letters revealing what Jesus' closest followers did after his time on earth. God used average people to heal all kinds of diseases and drive out demons. Many of Jesus' followers were killed because they dared to preach his message. Jesus claimed to be the human manifestation of God's unfailing love for humanity and the secret for true inner peace. He gave hope to the hopeless, love to the unloved, and then gave his life to bring never-ending life to everyone who would believe in him. That's where you come in. Beware, reading this book will change you. As you read it, its message of hope will come alive in you. That's what it's designed to do. Why not give it a shot and see for yourself what it says? It just might surprise you. You've been watching Las Vegas Tonight with your host, Dale Davidson. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of our show. We so appreciate your loyalty to our program. To keep Las Vegas Tonight on the air, please go to our website, vegasaints.org, and click the Donate button. To send a check or money order, please make it out to Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries and mail it to 9030 West Sahara Avenue, Suite 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. To suggest a guest to appear on the show or any other suggestions or questions, write to Dale at DaleWDavidson at Yahoo.com or call him at 702-480-3989.